So uh, you guys, I'd like for you guys to give a big Ohio welcome, Buckeye welcome, all right, to uh, Nick Smith. Y'all give him a round of applause. Then I'm going to talk about him here for just a second, let him preach. But I want to tell you, this guy right here, he is a brother from another mother, all right, right here. And uh, But you guys, he's got an awesome testimony. He's a youth pastor of East Pickens Baptist Church. Uh, youth, youth pastor, recovery pastor, like a whole bunch of different stuff. So I'll let him tell you whatever else he wants to tell about him. But uh, man, we're glad that you guys are with us, East Pickens, today. And uh, Nick... Ready to open up the word. So you guys open up the word with Nick. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Reagan. We're so excited to be here this week. And, uh, you know, we've had a great experience so far. Pastor Reagan was talking about uh, picking up all the weed. I even told our kids, I said, make sure we clarify what kind of weed we're talking about. Uh, uh, so we uh, we had a great time doing that, serving the community. And we're looking forward to, to other things this week that we're going to be doing. Um, and I told our group, I said, listen, anytime we're out in the community and we're doing something, we're doing it under the name of Grace Point. So uh, we want to come and undergird what you guys are doing and support uh, what the church is trying to do in this community. And we just want to be an encouragement to you and uh, hopefully help connect people to what you're doing here. So that's the reason we're here this week. And uh, so I appreciate you just being so welcome in that way. Uh, so Reagan kind of mentioned that I'm a recovery pastor. Uh, so I'm a student pastor and a recovery pastor. So I run a Celebrate Recovery Ministry at our church. And um you know, there's um, a lot of reasons why our area is uh, has a lot of addiction and things. Uh, but one of the things is me personally, I struggle with depression. And uh, so that's something that I've been learning to to deal with in a healthy way. I think as men, some of you guys can relate. We tend to stuff and act like we ain't got no problems. I ain't got no problems. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And we're tough guys. And so uh, God's really been working in my life over the past several years of uh, how when I am weak, he actually has the opportunity and ability to be strong. And uh, if we're just willing to humble ourselves, he will he will show himself to be strong in our lives. And so uh, that's part of what that ministry is all about for us at our church. Um, so I want to share a little bit of my story just to kind of connect what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I didn't grow up in a church family. My mom and my dad were completely unchurched. My, my father, his, um, his dad, my grandfather and grandmother, my grandmother was from Boston, Massachusetts. She said, get in the car. You know, so I told uh, she had the real Southern, uh, not Southern, but uh, real uh, New England uh, language and, and that kind of stuff. And so my, she was Catholic in background. And my grandfather, uh, he ran and operated uh, several beer joints. And he, that was his, how he made a living. So my dad grew up in that. And uh, so there was just this, that's kind of the life he knew. So my dad struggled his whole life with alcoholism and, and, and drugs, and he still struggles with that. Um, so my mom and my dad, you know, um, early on in my life, with all those struggles, got a divorce. And my grandfathers were the only father figures in my life, really. Um, you know, my dad never came to any of my sporting events and things like that. He was just, he was there, but he wasn't there. And uh, so my grandfathers, both of those uh, passed away when I was in middle school. So middle school was a very, very tough time for me. It was, I was trying to get in a gang, you know, and it, thank God it wasn't a real gang, but I thought it was, you know. <laughs> it was like one of those things. And, um, and I was just real wild and uh, just so far away from God and felt so unworthy to even pursue after God. And uh, so middle school was just horrible. I was depressed. I was in trouble. I was getting suspended. I was fighting. And back then they down in the south they were still paddling so i got paddle after paddle after paddle i still got calluses on my rear ends and that and uh i was just that kind of kid i was labeled it's like you're not going to be anything i had teachers tell me like you're not going to make it you're going to be in prison by the time you're 30. i'm 34 i'm not in prison praise god <laughs> they were wrong i wish they i could tell them that but you know there's a lot of things like that i got to high school and uh i began to get deeper into the mischief that i was in uh and i began to develop patterns and behaviors that were even more destructive in my life. And in 10th grade, uh, I met this young girl and um, young lady that was a Christian. And now I lived in the South and it's a little bit different than Ohio. Everybody says, oh, I'm a Christian. But you know, it's, you have to use discernment to say, what do they mean by that? Do they mean they go to church? Do they mean their grandma went to church one time? Do they, you know, so it's like you're trying to uh, do that. So like I, I believed in God uh, so I met this young girl, and she was uh, someone who really, I saw, God, I saw her faith. I saw that it was real. She wasn't perfect. Uh, and uh, one night, and when I was in 10th grade in my bedroom, I prayed to receive Christ. 
and it was an incredible experience, you know. Um, it was so powerful that I married that girl. She's my wife now. <laughs> and uh, this is my daughter, Adeline. Adeline Bay. Uh, she's my firstborn. Uh, but uh, she, uh, you know, that was kind of how I came to faith. And, and I remember going to church, and church was a weird experience for me. I was questioning, like, why does everybody bow their head at the same time? What if somebody comes in with, like, trying to, like, whop somebody? Or I was the kid in the pew, and everybody's bowing their head. I'm, I'm going to sneak a kiss in and kiss my girlfriend, you know. And, and I was just mischievous still as a Christian in church. And, and I was on the, if we went anywhere with the youth group, it was like, uh, you know, we're on the church bus, and they had to leave the lights on. They said, Nick, where's your hands? I'm like, they're right here. You know, I'm not doing anything mischief. I don't think, you know, I was getting in a lot of trouble. But what happened is God used that group of people to really teach me uh, who he was and and help me to know of his grace and his mercy. They loved me. And many of them, not all of them, but many of them loved me unconditionally. They took me as I was and they began to teach me. And through that, I began to see what God's love was all about. Now, I say I didn't grow up in church, so... I used to have this understanding. There was uh, the Ten Commandments. You guys are familiar with those. You've heard of them, maybe. And so the Ten Commandments was always this, this thing that I felt like Christians were holding up and declaring, like, these are important. But at the same time, they were doing it in a way that made me feel excluded from what was going on in their life. And I began to, you know, when I became a Christian, I felt called to ministry my first year of college. I'd never read the Bible. And I said, yes, God, I'll do it, which is crazy when I think about that. Uh, I never had read the Bible, and I said, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'm going for it. I stood up from my whole church and said, I'm going to be in the ministry. And they, I think everybody's face looked like this. They were just like, they couldn't believe it. And uh, so I took that phase in my life, and I just soaked up God's Word. I just dove in, and I wanted to know everything. And one of the first things I really looked at was His commands. What is, what's going on here? What is this? And I had this understanding that the commandments were meant to separate. It was like to weed out the wheat from the tares or the good people from the bad people. And many times, in, even in Christian community, it can seem that way. The commandments is a, it's a standard to separate us. And what I began to see is God was using the commandments not to create division between His people and the world, but He was using the commandments to teach His people how to reach the world. And that was first to love him. And when we love God, it's this relationship, this vertical relationship. When we love God, the next natural step is we love others. And so God used the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to show you this in just a second. He used it as a structure for them to see, hey, when you get this right, when you love me, you will love people. And so we're going to look at the commandments as a way that God gave his, these Israelite people uh, a format uh, and a, t- a tool a know-how, a knowledge of how to love Him and how to love others well. And so I don't know where you come from. I don't know your experience with church, but I want you to understand this is that um, whatever somebody has said to you in the past in regards to the commandments, I hope today that you walk away with a clear understanding and a clear picture with with God's purpose of why He gave us His law. There's a lot of people use God's Word to beat us up, right? And I want you to know that God's heart is that He is for you. He loves you. He cares for you. And you'll see that if we just look at what's going on. So uh, let's dive in. If you've got your Bibles and you want to follow along, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 20. And we're going to be following the commandments there. But as we, uh, as we go there, one of the things I want you to understand is first, is that the commandments were given to the Israelite people. These people were taken captive by the Egyptians. They come in with Joseph. You remember that story if you're familiar with that. Joseph comes in. He's sold into slavery by his brothers. Uh, through a miraculous series of events, God uh, puts him in charge of everything in Egypt. He becomes the next powerful person next to Pharaoh because of God's uh, provision in Joseph's life. Joseph then brings his family. He forgives them. He brings them to Egypt with him. He forgives his brothers that sold him into slavery. Uh, And so they they get there, and over the series of years, hundreds of years, uh, that family multiplies into millions of people. And that people are then oppressed. A different Pharaoh comes into rule. They, he begins to oppress those people, and that oppression leads to slavery. And they are thrown in. The whole people group, the Israelites, are put into slavery by Egyptians. And they're there for several generations. 
There's generations of Israelites who were born into slavery and they have never known freedom. They have forgot what freedom looks like. They forgot those memories. And I want you to understand this is important because the, I don't think we can, can relate to that fully. I don't think anybody in this room has, has probably been a slave. And, and if you have, then just I apologize. I hate that that's happened to you. But to be someone else to control you, someone else to control your life, this is what's happened. They had no vision for their life. They had no purpose for their life. They had no five-year plan. They had no 10-year plan. They had no, no retirement. They had no, no knowledge of what life could be other than somebody telling them, do this, don't do this. They were slaves. They didn't get to pick what their hobbies were, what their leisure time was going to be like. They had no leisure time. They were slaves. And this is the people that God miraculously delivers from, from Egypt. They go through the Red Sea and they come into the desert. And then there's a series of events where God is just loving on them. He's giving them the things they need. There's the pillow of fire by night. There's a cloud by day. And God is leading them to where He wants them to go. He's providing food for them. Manna falls from heaven. Quails come by the thousands and they just eat, eat, eat. The people are complaining they're wanting to go back. They're grumbling against God. And God just keeps blessing them and blessing them and blessing them. They don't have water. He commands Moses to strike a rock. Water comes from a rock. and they, God meets every need that they have. And He's bringing them to this place called Mount Sinai. And it's here that God establishes a covenant. It's a promise. And He says, you will be my people. And you will be different from the people all around you. And the reason you're going to be different, and I'm going to bless you, but the reason you're going to be different is because you're going to be set apart and you're going to show the world who I am. And he gives them a format, and that's the, 20, uh, the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. He says, this is how you're going to do it. Now remember, they were slaves. They had no understanding. They've lost their skills of how to operate a society. They had no governing skills. They had no leadership abilities. They didn't have any of that. And so God has given them tools to do that. I know we can't relate to that, but... One of the things that I think I want you to understand is I, I have personally known people who are in uh, been in prison for many years, 20 years, 30 years. And when they get out of prison, uh, I've talked to them. Some of them are actually family members of mine. And I've talked to them and I said, hey, what was that like? You know, when you spent those 20 years in prison locked up behind bars and you got out, what was that adjustment like? And every person I talked to, they, they explain this process of where they go through this, have to, you know, relearn skills to operate in society. I, I once talked to a pastor. He was uh, doing a ministry where he was helping inmates who were coming out of major penitentiaries to integrate back into society. And I thought about that. I said, integrate? What, how do you, you just get out? Like, you should be like, I'm free, woo, and just go. But what happens is, and a lot of people don't realize this, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, that people who are in prison for long periods of time, they undergo a psychological change. They lose social skills. They lose soft skills of how to interact with people. They lose the ability to, to think through processes. The pastor that I was telling you about, he said there was a man in his church. He came to his church, and uh, he'd been in prison for 40 years. And Wade was his name, and he Wade would stand up when people were worshiping, and everybody would sit down, and Wade would keep standing. He would stand there until someone said, Wade, sit down. And you say, sit down, Wade would sit down. And the pastor said it was so bad that, that Wade had to be told everything to do. In fact, there was this one woman in his church that come up and demanded that Wade marry her, and he did. And he said he couldn't say no. <laughs> so he married this woman, you know, and it's just kind of a joke. But that's kind of what the Israelites are doing is that they've lost their abilities to think. And so God, through the Ten Commandments, is going to reteach them what it means to love Him and what it really means to love God. So look with me. Let's read this real quick. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, it says, And God spoke all these words. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You should not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. You should not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will, hold, will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant, your maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. That's not talking about extraterrestrials, by the way. It's not those kind of aliens. In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all the... Th- that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so you may live long in the land the Lord is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his or or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. God has given the commandments to these people to, to show them how to love Him and how to love others. The first four commandments are dealing with how to love God. And we're going to break that down real quick. The last six commandments are showing us how to love other people. And this one I want you to understand is God is creating with the Israelites a culture, a people who are going to reflect Him in the society that they live in. He's establishing His people to be the light to the world. It is these people that Jesus is going to be coming through. You know, this this people group that God chose to say, you're going to be a witness to all the world, so all the nations will come to me. And I'm going to show you how to do that. And he's teaching them how to do that. The first command tells us that you should have no other gods before me. And this one I want you to understand is that God is here. He's not suggesting that, that... and we take our list of gods and that he's got to be on the top of that list. God is suggesting, he says, we shouldn't have a list. There is no list. He is the only God who is worthy of our worship. He is the only God worthy of honor and praise. He is the only one who is worthy of all that we have to offer. No one else. There is no list. And God is telling the, the Israelites they were in a culture with the Egyptian culture where they were worshiping many, many, many gods. The Egyptians worshiped the god, the sun god, Ra. They worshiped the river god. They thought the Nile River was a god and they worshiped the river god. They worshiped the frogs. They thought the frogs was gods. They had all these different things that they looked to and they ascribed you know, them a god. And you'll see it in the Old Testament. It's not just the Egyptians, but it's the cultures all around them. And here's what I want you to understand is every human being created was created to worship. And when we don't worship God, we worship something. And you say, not me. I don't bow down to no frog. That's ridiculous. But we allow something in our life that we place our affection and our, our, our passions on. And we, in essence, worship. It could be your spouse. It could be your kids. It could be all types of things. God is establishing this command. He says, don't worship. You will not worship any other gods before me. Because he wants to create in his people the virtue of them to be only a worshiper of him. That's one of the characteristics of God's people is that we worship one God and only one God. There are no lists of God's. The second commandment is you shall not make for yourself an idol. Here's something that's really cool is that a lot of people haven't thought about this, but the Israelites were actually skilled craftsmen. They were skilled at working with their hands. They were slaves and they've done this for generations. Now think about this. I went to Jerusalem not long ago and I got to look at the temple and I got to look at the city of David and I was like, wow, these people moved these huge rocks. What in the world? How did they figure that out? You know, they were doing that in Egypt. They were building the pyramids and they're moving this stuff, you know, and so they have this skill. But not only did it build like pyramids and things like they built idols for the people to worship. They were the idol builders. And in fact, if you go on like in Exodus 30, somewhere around there, you're going to see that they actually built a golden calf and they worship the calf. They are idol builders. And so here's what I want you to understand is that we all have that same capacity. We may not bow down to some silly statue and worship that statue, but when we, when we put our affection, we put our devotion on something else in our life, we're building idols. Listen, it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for three days or for 30 years. We all have the same capacity to build idols in our lives and to worship them. And you're like, I don't worship idols. Here's what I want to challenge you. Look at your calendar. 
Where's your, where's your time devoted to? If, how much of your time is, is devoted to loving God and loving others? That's hard. I had to do that, and I was like, man, I'm a pastor, and this sucks. Like, I'm not real good at this. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to, to look at that. Where's your treasure going? The things that God's given you, the resources, your giftedness, where are you spending that? A lot of times we allow other things in our life to be idols. Here's what God's wanting His people to be. He wants His people to be mindful not to make idols. That's important in their life. The third one is don't misuse the name of the Lord your God. Misusing God's name is, is often thought about saying cuss words. Don't say cuss words that include God or Jesus. Uh, but it's much more than that. It's misusing God's name is when we flippantly or we just commonly use God's name or we use his name as if it's some ordinary name just like Nick or Pastor Reagan. His name is set apart. God is much more than anything that we can comprehend. Listen, even the Bible is giving us a picture of who God is, but this is not all of who he is. He is much more. This is what he wants us to know about him. But see, we are finite. God is infinite. Listen, he, we are stuck in this time. We, the sun comes up, sun goes down, it's 24 hours in the day. God is outside of that. He's not confined by time. And when you look at the sciences in the world and you look at the astrology and all these things, and you think about you know, the black holes and I look at all these things going on in science and, and what's going on in outer space and the things they're discovering. Some people's like, God's not real. I'm like, are you crazy? Like, where is this stuff coming from? Like, it's a black hole. Where's the black hole come from? Who started the black holes? <laughs> God is beyond. He is much more than what we can comprehend. He is way bigger than any problem or any circumstance we have in our life. He is God. And when we use his name commonly or we use his name in a, like jokingly, we are really using his name in vain. And here's another way. When we use God's name for personal gain or personal glory or to gain position, we're using his name in vain. When I was um, first graduated high school uh, I went to school to be a welder and I was working in a fab shop and, and I was you know making like uh, close to twenty dollars an hour welding and things like that and I decided it was time to buy a truck I drew uh, drove this old rickety truck I could see the road when I was driving it it was old it was like a 1979 Toyota I don't even know if you know what that is but it was like rickety raggedy I called it the mater can uh, and it was like old rusty loud and i was like you know what i got money in the bank i'm making good paychecks as an 18 year old i'm gonna buy me a truck god wants me to be happy and god wants me to have this truck and i felt confident that god wanted me to have this truck and i went out and bought this brand new uh, or new to me um toyota tundra fully loaded power windows leather seats i even had the button where i could crank that baby out the window like <laughs> i felt like a man you get me? See, I don't know if it's like this in Ohio, but in the South, if you are a man and you're not driving a truck, it's questionable if you really are a man. And I felt like this is going to complete my manliness. This is going to help me break through into manhood. And I got this truck and I was like, yeah. It even had flow masters. I don't know if that means anything to anybody, but it was like, as I drove off, I was like, yeah, I'm a man. And I remember I'm riding down the road just feeling like a man. Well, here's what happened. I had the truck about three weeks and I quickly realized that God didn't want me to have that truck. But I had just attached my desire or I took my desires and my want to's and I attached God's name to it. And after I uh, kind of realized the gas price and the insurance cost and, and all the things like that, I was like, whoa, this is a bad mistake. I sold that truck to some other preacher. Uh, <laughs> I was like, brother, call me in a couple weeks if you have the same struggle, you know? <laughs> a true story. His grandson wrecked it a month later, and I was like, nobody, God wants nobody to have that truck. <laughs> but here's the deal. Misusing God's name is, is really God wants us to be a people who carefully uses his name because we're representing him to the world. We're, letting, we're allowing, we're setting his name apart not just in thought and idea, but also in speech and how we go about talking about it, how we demonstrate 
to other people who he is. Be careful of what you're attaching his name to in your life. Because it may not be of him. It may not be, it may be you. And when we attach him to things, you, some of you guys have, may have seen TV preachers asking for money and you've probably got a bad taste in your mouth. I want to apologize. That is not an accurate picture of Christianity. That is not an accurate picture of the gospel. That's not who God is. God's not saying send him $100 and he'll send you 1000 through the mail if you've got the faith. That's not God. People are misusing God's name. They're using it for their own glory, for their own gain. And, and don't confuse that. The fourth one is keep the Sabbath day holy. This is revolutionary for the, the Egyptians, uh, for the Israelites. Because they were in Egypt. They were slaves. They, they worked every day, all day long. They, they had no vacation. They had no uh, retirement plan. They had no concept of leisure time. There was no leisure time. You work when the sun comes up and you go to bed and you get up and you work until the, you know, it's just this ongoing cycle. There was no Sunday, no take a rest, no lake day, go to the lake with your kids and your family, no parks. There was none of that. No recreation. It was work. And life was work and work was life. And so God is establishing with his people the command to rest, to be still. This was revolutionary for not only there, but for the surrounding societies and cultures. This, there was, this was like mind-blowing that this was even possible. And listen, when I went to Jerusalem, they still take this like way to the extreme. There was an elevator in the hotel I was staying with. It was on the Sabbath day, which is a Saturday for Jews. And I walked into the elevator and because you can't press buttons on the Sabbath, you had to ride every floor. I was on the 20th floor. And the elevator would stop on every floor and open the door and close the door. It was a Sabbath elevator. I quickly learned that there was an elevator behind that one in the hallway, like where the garbage stuff was, for all the workers who were uh, Muslim. And that's the one I started using. <laughs> so, but God has established with his people this, this, this rest. He wants them to rest because he wants them to reflect. If we're going to be a people of God, we have to learn to break from the busyness of life. And we have to learn to reflect on who he is. And here's what it's saying. What I need most is not work or to accomplish my to-do list. What I need most is my God. I need personal time with him. What I need most is not a day at the lake or a vacation, what I need most is to be refreshed by God's presence in my life. That's what I need most. And it was revolutionary for, for these people. The, the next couple, we're going to go through really quick, so the next six, and this is really helping us get a landscape of what it looks like to love other people. Now, this is especially true for the church. Your love God is your personal worship. This is your relationship with God. But now this includes everybody in the room. This is how do you love this community? How do you, as God's people, as Grace Point Church, how are you going to love this community and lead them to Christ? Be a light in their darkness. God's going to show the Israelites here what he's called them to do. First one, he says, honor your father and your mother. That's command five. And I know this is probably hard for some people. Maybe you haven't had parents that, are, that you just have a lot of respect for. Maybe your parents have harmed, hurt you or mistreated you. I understand that. But here's what I want you to understand. There's a principle here that God wants his people to take care of. He wants them to honor those closest to them. I've told my students, because I know some of my students have, have been abused by their parents. And I says, listen, who's that person in your life loving you and caring for you like a parent? God wants you to honor them. Honor them. What does it mean to honor? It means to take care of them. It means to... Uh, to go out of your way to include them in what's going on. You know, the, there's four generations during this time that are living in the household. Uh, think about that. And, and it's saying to honor your parents. It means to take care of them. There was no, no uh, Medicare system. There was no nursing assistance. There was no uh, assisted living. There was no uh, nursing home. If, if your parents and your, your great-grandparents or your grandparents were going to be taken care of, it was the responsibility of that. And God was building in this community the virtue of a community who honor other people, who look out for the well-being of other people. And he's starting in the home with the family, honor your father and your mother. It's not just a command for your children to obey you. which That's nice, and it's good to use that, you know. But it's to, to take care of them, to, 
to honor them in the way we live. The, the sixth one is you shall not murder. This is, is in our society, you know, we have a lot of conflicts about life. And uh, what God is trying to establish here is a community of people who is a community that will stand for life. He wants us to be a virtue where life is important. Every life matters. You know, it's not just little lives or old lives. It's every life. When I was a teenager, I, I struggled with depression and I still struggle with it occasionally. But in those moments in my teen years, there was times where I was like, I don't know if it's worth it keep going. I don't know if we should just take this, you know, I felt despair. I felt like my life was meaningless, that it was just full of a bunch of junk and that there was no light at the end of the tunnel. I just felt like at times that I didn't even want to keep my life as a teenager. I felt overwhelmed by my depression. I looked at the circumstances of my family. My dad's strung out on drugs. My mom is trying, she can't keep a job. She's trying to find a job. Uh, at one point in my life, I'm living in a trailer that has no lights, has no power, has no water. Uh, and I'm just sleeping on a bed that's on a floor with a cover. And uh, I walk, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed of it. I'm trying to hide it from people. And people are like, hey, you got power? I'm like, what's that note on your door? And that kind of stuff, you know? But here's what I want you to understand, is that no matter how bad it gets, God is the author of life. He gave you life. And not only did He give you physical life, He wants to be the Father who gives you a spiritual life. And He can take whatever circumstances you're in, whatever things are going on around you, if you will give it to Him, and you will trust Him, God will make it better. I can't say that He's going to take it away. He didn't take my depression away. It's a thorn in my flesh, as Paul would say. But you know what I found out? It's the very thing that God uses in my life to keep me humble. When I think I'm like really great and awesome, I'm reminded that I need Him. Every time I struggle, I'm reminded that I can't do it without Him. There is no greater blessing in my life. I'm like, I need the Lord and I have a constant reminder of my frailty. If you struggle with depression, if you've struggled with wanting to take your life, don't do it. God gave you life. Give your life to Him. Let Him remake your life. Let Him give you new life is what Jesus said. I've come to give you life and life abundant. He will give you new life. Pastor Reagan says we're baptized into Christ and we're raised to walk in the new life. He will give you new life. We are a people who stand for life. The seventh one says you shall not commit adultery. We know what that means. And we stop often right there, but really the virtue that God wants to establish in our heart is He wants us to be a people who are faithful. Because we're, we're to our community, we're, we're showing them the character and the virtues of God, of how we live. This, sometimes the only Bible somebody's going to read is your life. And so when they see a people who are faithful first to the, their spouse, that's important. Faithful to your wife, faithful to your husband, faithful to your children, faithful to your congregation, your church, faithful to the people in your small group, taking care of each other, loving each other, faithful to your pastor. Like there's a, there's a virtue of faithfulness because we're representing a God who is faithful to us. And that faithfulness is not given because we deserve it, because we are unfaithful to Him. But He keeps on pursuing us. He keeps loving us. And He continues His faithfulness to us. He wants us to have that virtue. Number eight says, you shall not steal. Stealing is taking something that, does, that wasn't yours to take. Is birthed from selfishness. The, the core of stealing is that you see something that somebody has or, or something uh, around you that doesn't belong to you. You want it and you take it. You're selfish. And what you've said in that moment, I know this is wrong, or maybe you don't realize it's wrong, but you said, I got to have that. And you take it away. Really, God is telling us uh, not to steal. The virtue that he wants us to have is generosity. Because that's the opposite of stealing, right? If, we're, if stealing is to be selfish, well, the opposite of being selfish is to be generous. And so God wants us as His people to live in this world, to operate in this world, and for this community to be able to look at Grace Point Church, to be able to look at East Pickens Baptist Church and say, hey, those people are generous. Why? And it's that opportunity we get to say, because of Jesus Christ and what He's done in our heart and our life, B, 
Be a people who are generous. Nine says, do not give false testimony against your neighbor. You know, one of the names for Satan in the scriptures is that he's the father of all lies. He's, he's the accuser of the brother. He's accusing people. He's, he's, he's bringing in lies. He's grumbling, complaining, all types of things. And, and giving a false testimony against your neighbor is really the core of what's being uh, said here is that God desires for us as a people to be a community that operates in honesty. We're not backbiting and, you know, looking at everybody's garbage and we're not talking about people behind their back. We're not making up stuff about people. But we are people who are honest. Honest with ourself. Honest with God. Honest with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're honest. That honesty is hard sometimes, right? It's like, you're so awesome. Really, I'm not. That's hard to swallow sometimes. But that honesty leads us to an integrity that other people get to see. And they get to see that God is honest with us. He tells us the truth, right? It's truth and grace. Grace and truth. Uh, I always like to say, folks, you know, He gave the commandments, but right before He gave the commandments, He gave a lot of grace. A lot of grace. He set them free before they loved Him. He set them free before they worshipped Him. He said, you know what I'm saying? And God wants to be that for you in your life. And lastly, you shall not covet. This is kind of a funny one because this is... Um, also a reflection of our heart, like the first four, not to covet. Covetness is, is, is a, I think, a huge problem that we have in America. Our culture breeds it. We have advertising companies who are spending billions of dollars every year to trigger covetness in your life so that you will sense, I need, I need this iPhone. I left mine down there. I need this. I got to have this. Or you see people who have the, the iPhone XR or, or like uh, all these new technologies and you see people using them and they're doing these cool things and you're like, and then your response is like, I'm lesser of a person. I got to have that. Listen, some of you guys, like you're on Facebook and like, I mean, yeah, Facebook. And it's like, you're just scrolling through Facebook and you're like just wanting everything that everybody's got. Everybody's posting how awesome their family is. They don't post the fight they just had or they're, they're showing their clean house and they're not, they're not showing the trash that they just took out and the, the cockroaches that live under their trash can. Nobody's taking pictures of that, putting it on Facebook. They're not taking pictures of their slobby kid's room. You know, they're putting them, I went out to eat, the prime rib. They're not taking a picture of the peanut butter and jelly they ate, you know, for lunch. And so what's happened is we're looking at all this stuff that people have in their life, and we're, and we're like, man, what's wrong with my life? Why don't I take a vacation every month? Like that person has been to Turk and Casco, or I didn't even say that right, Turks and Cake, whatever. <laughs> They've been all over the world. Like, what's wrong with me? I can't do that. And we start coveting, we start wanting. But here's what I want you to understand is that covetousness is dangerous because essentially what it's saying is I don't have what I need. And if you don't know the Lord, that is true. But when you know Jesus Christ, and this is what I've come to believe, is that everything you need, you have. And we are to be a people that will blow our community's mind because we are a people who are content. That's a hard word. We are a people, says no matter our circumstances, no matter our financial destitute, no matter any of this, we can learn through our struggles, through our trials, through our hardships. We can be content with where we are and what we have because we have what's most important. We have the Lord. We have God. And He can feel every desire and every need in your life. I want you to think about this. What is, what is covetousness? What is it? It's keeping up with the Joneses. Seeing your neighbor, they get the new car. You don't have the new car. It's feeling that need to, to go get it, to keep up with the trends in society. It's keeping up or desiring a title or position. I don't have my doctorate. Uh, can I tell you a secret? I don't have my bachelor's degree either. I'm almost there, but I've been working on that. And over the years, chunking away at a little at a time. I don't have a seminary ring that I get to show off when I go to youth ministry circles. You know, like I, I see some guys and they got these big college rings. And when I was a young youth pastor, man, it was hard. It was hard to go in there. Which seminary did you 
graduate from? I said, the one that Jesus went to. <laughs> Which one was that? It was like a carpenter shop, but mine was a welding shop. Uh, <laughs> nah, it's hard. Or wishing you had that giftedness or that talent. Somebody's really good at something and you see that and you're like, man, if I could have that gift, if I could have that talent, I would feel better about myself. Or wanting that look or that shape or that size. Our culture is obsessed with our image of feeling like we have to be a certain body type to be a person. It's ridiculous. Or wanting that thing or that possession. Here's, here's what happens, guys. Is really, we feel like we need those things so we can feel validated. So we can feel loved, feel important, feel liked, feel accepted, feel worthy. So we can feel needed. Here's what I want you to say is that God can meet every one of those needs. Everything that you need, that you look at stuff or positions or people, God can be that in your life. And He wants to be that in your life. In closing, here's what I want you to understand. Pastor Ray, you want to come on up? Is that the commandments were given not to show us how perfect His people are, but the commandments were given for the Israelites to create in them a heart that longed for the Savior because they understood and they realized they could not keep the commandments. I hope today as I read this, you was like, there's no way in God's green earth that I could keep all those commands. And you know what? You're exactly right. He didn't give them so you could keep them. He gave them so you would know that you need a Savior. It tells us in the Scripture in Galatians, it tells us, it says that God's Word, the law, the Old Testament, was a tutor to keep us until Christ would come to set us free. See, the prophets, Moses, Isaiah, those guys, they long for a Savior that was coming, and we long for a Savior that has come. They look to a saving faith, of the Savior that was coming, and we look to the saving faith of the Savior who died for us. So I want you to understand today, no matter where you are, what you've done, no matter, I hope that you realize you've broke all these, because I know I have. <laughs> but God's grace covers a multitude of our sin. He loves you. And when we get this right, the church will explode because we will be best equipped in our society to love other people and show them the God that created them. Thank you. Would you guys thank Nick for sharing with us today, you guys? Would you bow your heads with me?